Uh, thank you, Matthew. Yeah, I'm Steve Gray from WMA Water. We're a consultancy uh, from Sydney specialising in flood hydrology uh, and doing studies under the New South Wales Floodplain Risk Management Program. Um, I'll just get into it and we'll... we'll okay. Ah. Yeah, what I'm going to do today is, of course, this is our first meeting in this study, and so what I want to do is just give you some context for why the study is happening, and uh, sort of the overall context of other studies that have led to this one, because um, this is the management study. Uh, so this is when we actually look at the flood risk and how we might manage that flood risk uh, moving into the future. S sorry? Oh, uh, and we're building on a, a 2006 study in doing this work. So yeah, I'll just talk about the context and the work we've done to date. Uh, the new data that's gone into this, which includes a community consultation uh, where we've picked up peak uh, flood marks from the June 2013 event. Um, I'm going to talk about the actual flooding mechanisms that we're modelling, because of course this is not about stormwater or overland flow. This is about mainstream and tributary flooding. So it's sort of rising water, if you like, and also ocean levels, elevated ocean levels. Again, just I guess to get into the context, we're going to talk about some historic events in the catchment. It's always good, I think, to talk about previous events so that we can reflect on what's happened in the past and what sort of levels those kind of floods achieved. Um, look, very quickly, I'm going to talk about the, the more technical aspects, the, the models that we build, uh, these computer models, um, in order to model uh, these statistical floods. It's those statistical floods which are used as part of the planning process. And that's for council planning to sort of establish where development should be and should not be um, in regards to flood risk. But it's also the SES management of that flood risk that this study feeds into. So looking at areas which are likely to flood, which do have populations in them, and how that can best be managed. Um, we do have some draft design results today to show you. So some maps um, and also some levels. And we're going to compare those to the 2006 study they are draft, so currently there's a study, a report that's with Council and with um, OEH, the State Government, and that's being reviewed, and so these are not confirmed uh, design maps or levels yet. And then I'll just talk about where we're going forward to in the future, and actually if we can we'll briefly touch on the kinds of mitigation uh, works that we might be able to implement to reduce the flood risk in some cases. So, yeah, there was a flood study that was completed in 2006. And so here we are in 2014, eight years later. And the flood study looks at really the first two stages of the overall floodplain risk management process, and that's data collection and the flood study. Now, why are we, sorry, what we're doing as the first step in this study, which is step three, is we actually review that flood study that got completed in 2006. Why do we do that? Because technology moves on. And Frankly, there's been some very rapid changes in this particular area. Um, so, for example, the previous study used a model at the time that was state-of-the-art, and that was a, a 1D model based on cross-sections. Well, what's happened since then is that we've got cheap uh, data that's available, which is quite an, uh, quite an improvement, and that defines the overbank area in great detail. And I'll just go into that in a tick. So, that overbank uh, detail that we can then use to inform what we call a 2D model. So that's when the water can move uh, upstream, downstream and to the side as it wants to under the influence of momentum and gravity is a big improvement. Um, we tend to get better representation of overbank storage in such a model and that's very important for catchments like these where there is a lot of storage. We do have, I'm sure you saw today perhaps after the rainfall, a lot of water hanging around um, puddling, if you like, and it's those overbank areas which can be very important in actually reducing the design flood level because it provides storage for flood waters. So we'll get into some of those details in a tick. I just want to talk about, I guess, what we've done so far in the study. This is our first meeting, of course. And so what we've done is we've collected some data. We've actually, coming into the study, realised that we needed some survey data, and that's because 
This aerial laser scanning survey technique I talk about, which informs our 2D models, doesn't penetrate water, and so we had to have some survey beneath the water line. That's what we call bathymetry data. We also went out to the community with a questionnaire, so we sent out about 800 of these, trying to get more information about what people have seen in regards to flooding in the catchments. Um, we then built these models. There's the hydrologic model that turns the rainfall into flow, the hydraulic model which turns the flow into an extent and a depth and a level. We've also looked at the rating. There's a, a gauge on Currenbean Creek just downstream of the Prince's Highway. That's been there for a long time and so that's a real asset to a study like this. So we've actually had a, a really good look at that and got some cross-section survey there to help us do some work. Then we've done this thing where we take those models that we've built and we try to establish that they are accurate by seeing how well they can model an actual event that's occurred in the catchment. So for example, we had the June 2013 event last year and we've got some flood levels from that through community consultation. We've put that rainfall into our model and then we see how well our model can represent that. And in that way, we assess the accuracy of the models we have built. And finally, we've gotten into these design flows and trying to establish those design levels. And as I say, that's currently in draft form. All right, so just to think about the new data for a second, this is the aerial laser scanning survey data. You can see here we've got a plane that's shooting down a laser beam that bounces back up to the plane. Surprisingly, this is quite accurate, plus or minus 150 mil for three quarters of the points or so. This gives us really good detail in the overbank where that flood water breaks out of the stream and goes and stores, and also where we have tributary flow paths coming in. The only problem is it doesn't penetrate water or vegetation. Okay? So you can imagine in some places we've got some pretty thick vegetation, so we're not getting a point every 1.2 square metre, but we're still getting enough points to define that uh, topography. And as I say, where it doesn't penetrate water, we've actually had to go and send in a surveyor. So look, on the, on the right-hand side here, in those purple lines, they're cross-sections that we got someone to survey in the creeks. So we've got the location up at Currenbean Gauge that's been surveyed so that we could do a better job of modelling at that gauge location. And you can also see at the outlets there. So there's Currenbean Outlet just at Huskisson on the right-hand side and there's the Moona Moona outlet just below Elizabeth Drive on the top right there. So we've got some survey data just to supplement that overbank um, survey. This data is absolutely important. What we find with the computer models these days is if this data is good, then it's very difficult for us to go wrong. In the sense, particularly in these catchments, because you have a very extensive overbank. And so even if our flow estimate is slightly off, we don't have much difference in the actual water level that gets achieved. So it's very important data. This is the community consultation map. So these are all of the responses we got from sending out 811 letters to the community and saying, what do you know about flooding? Um, can you tell us anything about flooding? Have you got any photos? And better yet, have you got a flood mark that we can use to see if our model is doing a good job or not? Um, we got a 17% response rate from the 811 we sent out. So we got 140 back. That might not sound like much, but that's actually really good. Um, a lot of the studies I do, it's always sub two figures. So 7%, that kind of thing. And part of that's because we targeted the mail out. We didn't send it to everybody. What we did was we did some preliminary model runs and we found out who was likely to be in a vicinity, perhaps, of some flooding. Doesn't mean, of course, that if you got one, that we think you're flood prone. That's not the case. Um, and so out of that, what was interesting, I suppose, is that we had around about 80 people or 80 homes that were aware of some flooding. 36 of those have actually experienced some flooding. That was usually just in the yard area, okay? That was just in the lot, so not over floor or anything like that. And what we found out that there were nine lots that were flooded in the June 2013 event, people were telling us about. And from that, we also got some hotspot areas that we call them. So places where there's a bit of a flooding issue. These are particularly salient for the SES. One of the big issues with flood risk 
in fact, where you see most people lose their lives in flooding is when they're trying to cross a flooded road. That's a big no-no. And so we've got these areas of Falls Creek Road, Duncan Street, Currambine Street, Willamire Road. And the best thing out of this was that we got flood marks to survey. Because as I say, that's what we use to assess the accuracy of the modelling system that we set up before we go and define design flood behaviour. So what I want to do now is just clarify exactly what we're doing in this because of course people get wet in their home, that's flooding basically, but of course you have a difference between storm water and rising water, mainstream flooding. Most people are probably most familiar with that through reading insurance policies I suppose. So what we're doing is we are looking at creek flows and tributaries of those creeks. That's what we're modelling. And in conjunction with that, we're taking a previous state government report on ocean levels and incorporating that. Because of course you can have that situation. And in fact, that's what happened last year. June 2013 was a, a reasonably big rainfall event, about a five or a 10 year. But we actually had quite an elevated tide level at the same time. It was a little bit higher than the highest astronomical tide, at around about 1.1 metres. Now, you see climate change is included there, and I just want to clarify, that's not to be included in the planning level necessarily. It's a sensitivity run. And so the reason we do that is just to see if flood risk dramatically worsens if you do have the predicted sea level rise. So we look at scenarios there. But what we're not looking at is local drainage. Okay? So for example, pipes makes very little difference to the work we're doing because the capacity of flow is very, very minor, although we will have culverts at road crossings and things like that. So that's, those are the flood mechanisms that we're looking at in this study. And this is, just, this is just clarifying how we do this. This is what I was just talking about, these New South Wales 2009 guidelines where we have, now you see these terms, I'm going to explain these in a tick, but essentially this is the 100 year the 1% annual exceedance probability. That's a, something that should happen on average once every 100 years. Now the problem is it's not always average. So I've seen places that have had the 100 year event, one year and then the next year. Now that's the way things are with statistics. So over the long term though, on average once every 100 years. So we combine the, the 100 year rainfall event with a 20 year ocean level and then and swap that around. And that's, that's how we actually look at these, sort of, if you like, the 100 year event or the planning event. And that is very much in accordance with New South, New, uh, New South Wales State Government Guideline from 2009. Yeah, so just talking about that terminology, I thought we could put that in the context of some historic events. So when we look at the rainfall data and we look at the flow data at the current bean gauge, there's one event that really, really sticks out, and that's the 1971 event. It was an absolute monster, and we think it was about a 300-year event. So an event that, on average, will happen once every 300 years. Yeah? And so that's just to give you some context for not just that event. I'm not too sure how many people have any knowledge of that. I did see a couple of nodding heads, so hopefully some people have got some memory of it. It'd be fascinating to hear about it. Um, we also, of course, you can see in the 70s, had a bit of a wet sequence. So we had some pretty substantial events, 74, 75 and 76. And all of them slightly bigger than what we had last year, June 2013. And you can see June 2013, we said it's a five to 10 year rainfall, but with a high tide. And that can make a real difference at the downstream ends of these catchments. Not so much in the upstream, but certainly the downstream ends but one of, the, one of the features of the downstream end is you won't see levels change dramatically. It doesn't tend to scale too much at the downstream end of these sort of river ocean interface systems. What you've got down here, this sort of sinusoidal jumpy uh, graph here, that is the ocean level, so the sea level, and you can see in red we've actually highlighted where that level got higher than the highest astronomical tide for the June 2013 event. Okay, so this is where I'm just going to get into these models that we built. I, I really won't dwell on this too much because I'm sure that the, you know, I'm not too sure how high the interest level is. We'll get onto the actual maps um, in a second. This is the model that turns the rainfall into flow. Um, Karen Bean is the one on the top. 
So this one here, all the way down here, and that's about 160 square kilometres. Uh, Moona Moon is to the south, of course, and that's about 28 square kilometres. So you can imagine current bean is going to have a lot more flow because the bucket's a lot bigger, yeah? So it's capturing a lot of rainfall and concentrating it all down into this area just north of Huskisson. Uh, Moona Moona, one of the interesting things about Moona Moona really is that it is very, very flat and doesn't have a very well-defined water course until you get just upstream of the Elizabeth Drive Bridge, really. Anyway, that's the model that converts the rainfall to runoff. This is the hydraulic model. This turns that runoff into an extent that we can map. We get levels. The levels can inform, for example, what height should someone's floor be for a new development. Um, and as I say, this is where we get the mapping from. And all these colours represent different features in the model where we're applying flow, for example, or even structures in some cases, like bridges and things like that. Now, if we just sort of highlight these areas, you can see this one up here, this is the area where there's a, a, a temple development proposed. And so this has been incorporated into the model. And this is in addition, if you like, to what was modelled in the 2006 study. And this area down here, George's Creek, that's been added too. Again, because there's places where we're seeing up zoning areas. So we're seeing rezoning and potential development. And so the idea is to look at those in the context of flooding and see if there are appropriate locations for that development. Here's Moona Moona. Um, so the, the red line is just defining that area that's in our hydraulic uh, study area. And so it's in this area that we'll present results, levels, mapping, etc. Okay, so here's our, the first map we're looking at. This is for current bean, and this is calibration. This is our model trying to match the June 2013 event. Okay, and so what data do we have? We don't have satellite extent maps. What we've got are four peak flood levels that we got from the community by the community consultation process. So uh, Zach here has put the rainfall into his model. Um, that has then put the flow into the hydraulic model. And then he compares what levels he gets out of the model with what, he, what the surveyor told him was achieved. And these are at people's properties where they observed a peak water level based on that event. And so what we see is we see a fairly good match. We're seeing a match which averages about 0.1. One of them is spot on, so 0.0. .0. We only go to one decimal point. We don't want to be too picky. Um, one of them is out by 0.2 of a metre, and the other are out by 0.1 of a metre, just 0.1 of a metre. Yeah? And so that's the, that's the um, evidence we have that the model can recreate an observed event. Uh, in Moona Moona, unfortunately, so this is Wallamai, we're just focusing on the Wallamai result. And again, we didn't have a satellite extent or an area extent to compare to. So what we've got is a peak flood level just down here on the creek edge that's been matched quite well. So that's a 0, 0.0. And you can, you can see what's being shown in the map. In the dark blue, that's where it's really flowing deeply, and that's usually in the creek itself. These areas here behind Wallamai Road, for example, where you've seen these lighter shades of blue, it's got a legend down here, but it, it's, it's shallow water. Most of it, it's not from the creek itself, it's from tributary flow coming in, and it's just really storing and doing nothing, very shallow. And that is what I'm saying about this place having an extensive overbank. It has an extensive storage in the overbank for floodwaters. They're not constrained in ravines or anything like that. And so you don't see flood levels change precipitously for different events. Here in Moona Moona, this is the calibration event. We've only got one mark from the community consultation process. And um, that's got a very good match to it. You can see how the floodwaters fringe on the residential development area here. And so we were driving around there today. Obviously, there's some property which, you know, the house might be well up, but the actual backyard itself or the front yard is quite low, in fact just a slightly higher than the sort of the swamp level if you like, the rhizomes that you can see from your front yard. And so you can see how that water fringes on the property and it's very shallow, just puddling. So having established that our models are doing a reasonable job 
of emulating the June 2013 event, a real event based on these flood marks. We can then put the statistical rainfall, the design rainfall into them, and we can get this one, the 1% 1 AEP result, which is the same as the 100 year, and we can start to look at these. But as I say, these are just draft, so I'm just going to go through these reasonably quickly today. This is not finalised yet, so these, these might actually change. Yeah. So we just have a quick look at what these results look like. And you can see we've got a zoom in here of the, the main area of interest, sort of the Huskisson area there. And that's uh, shown up here in this top corner. Again, the darker blue is where it's deep, and you can see that how that's confined to the creek. In the overbank, it's uh, shallow, and you've, well, it's more shallow than in the creek anyway. In some areas, it's getting quite deep, up to about 1.5 metres in the 100-year event. Now, I thought what would be interesting too, we just zoom in here, for example, and here's Woolamire Road and Woolamire Island, okay? And you can see there's property fringing onto that flood extent with just very shallow water on the lot. This does not mean that there's necessarily overflow flooding. Do you know what I mean? Because this is just shallow water on the lot. But of course, there could be in some cases, especially for houses which are built lower. This is my Ola over here on the eastern side. And we see a similar thing where some of the property that's fringing onto Currenbean Creek has got some shallow water in the lot. And again, this doesn't necessarily mean that there's overflow inundation. There's just water in the yard, perhaps in some cases. And as I say, these results are just draft. These are going to be revised, probably. If we look at Moona Moona, just like the calibration event, and this is exactly what you'd expect. In Moona Moona, you won't see much difference between the June 2000 event, 2013 event, sorry, and um, some of these larger design events, because it doesn't scale that much. You can see how we've got, if I can move a, no. You can see how we've got this inundation that's fringing on the development areas, shallow water, not necessarily overflow again. And this is one of the things that will happen when we finalise the design work is we will compare this to the surveyed floor levels that we have and we'll actually look at the overflow flood liability and the damages from that. So this is a zoom in on the southern end, Vincenia. So you can see that there's some shallow water in some of those properties, for example. And, you know, probably some depths up to sort of 0.5 of a metre in some of them. Now, what this result here is, this is what we call a profile. We just take the peak levels coming down Currenbean Creek here, and what you're seeing is at the, the bottom about 20 kilometres of that, okay? And so what we're comparing here, in these red dots, that's the 2006 hundred-year levels. The yellow line, the yellow solid line, is one of our design scenarios, and that's a particular duration. It's a 48-hour duration event. And what we wanted to point out here is simply that you can see that our levels are lower than the 2006 study in those upper areas. And that's because probably the 2D model just affords a bit more flood storage. It's not as constrained. In the areas in the downstream, including Willamaya, what we're seeing is that we're higher, you can see, than those red dots. And the main reason for that is that we have taken this New South Wales 2009 guideline and used this 20-year ocean condition. Okay? And so in the 2006 study, they did what was best practice at the time, which was to take a level around about the highest astronomical tide. And so we're significantly higher than that, and that makes a difference in that downstream area. Okay? So that's a comparison of our draft design levels with the 2006 study and the blue dots and the blue lines a comparison of the 10-year behaviour. So the, the orange stuff and the red dots is the 100 year and the other is the 10. And that's just sort of showing you indicatively, indicatively where it's going. So as I say, the, the draft design result, results are draft and there's a council and OEH review of those that's ongoing at the moment. It's not finalised. If we look at the flood liability, we're estimating it looks like there's about 10 properties in Moona, Moona that has some flood liability, we think. Uh, Will Meyer about 30, because there are some properties there that are fringing onto the creek, and so there's some more significant depths. Um, in Myola, we think it's about 10, but of course we're going to finalise this with this overflow flood liability assessment. You could certainly say, as a general characterisation, that you don't see flood levels change dramatically 
as flow changes in these catchments because you have such an expansive overbank area. And that's good for flood risk. It tends to reduce the flood risk. I've worked at places, for example, that you see a change of several metres between, say, the 10-year event and the 100-year event. And that's, that's a scary situation, but we don't have that situation here. Yeah? Um, we do see some sensitivity to the outlet condition, so what the actual entrance looks like. And what we'll be um, including, based on some sort of preliminary conversations to date, is there will be some scour um, included in the work. Because, of course, when you do have a very large flow, you have some pretty high velocities, say in Currumbeen Creek, where it's squeezing out the gap where you've got the sand spit uh, coming back towards the wharf there at Huskisson. So you will see some erosion of that sand spit and it'll, it'll widen out slightly, that entrance, for example. Um, but that doesn't have much impact. It has a, quite a bit of impact at the entrance location itself. But once you get to Willamire, for example, it's only worth about a foot. But we'll certainly be looking at that. Um, and yeah, and compared to the 2006 study, what we're generally saying is in the upstream areas we're lower, but in the downstream areas we're slightly higher because we're now using a 20-year ocean condition, which of course is, is significantly higher, about 0.7 higher than what was used in the 2006 study. So where do we go from here? Well, the first thing that we've got to finalise are these new design levels. And as I say, that reports with Council and OH at the moment. Then we get into the flood damages assessment. We actually look at the overflow flood liability and we use the surveyed floor levels for that work. Then once we've established what the flood risk is, and this might include, for example, also road crossing depths, etc., we're actually looking at how are we mitigating that. And there's usually three ways that we look at. There's planning, so we can not zone areas for, say, residential de development that are flood prone, for example. Um, there are actual works that you can implement. So I guess that the, um, the classic example of an engineering work to mitigate flood risk would be in Wagga, for example, where they have a levee. Yeah? Not that I'm suggesting that we'd necessarily look at anything like that, but that's a classic sort of work that you talk about. I think a, a good example here might be the Elizabeth Drive Bridge in the Moona Moona catchment. That's quite constraining and elevates levels upstream in an extreme flood. So expanding that, for example, be, might be one of the things that you would do. And that's really what the models are very good at. Instead of having to do that and see what it does, we can implement that in the model and see what the changes are to design levels. And the other thing, of course, is that this study has to integrate with the SES, and that's all about flood emergency response. So that might be identifying places that get cut off, that don't have road aggress when we have a certain flood level, looking at warning times and how we might achieve that. Um, yeah, so integrating into SES uh, flood emergency response plans. We distill all of that work. We try to get some feedback from the community along the way, or rather we do. And then we actually put that into a plan. So this is what's going to happen um, moving forward in order to manage flood risk in these two catchments. So one of the um, elements, of which obviously people are going to have questions, well, I hope they're going to have questions, and um, we'd like to discuss those today, but certainly one of the things that we'd be interested to get some preliminary feedback on are flood mitigation options. Often people who live in the catchments have some ideas about how things could be improved in particular areas, and that might be just a tributary flow issue rather than the main creek itself, but we'd be happy to discuss that too today. Thank you very much for your time.